If you're trying to better understand bioenergetics and the three primary energy systems, then this video is for you. If you're inside of the NASM material, chapter eight, bioenergetics, or even if you're just studying to become a personal trainer and you're really trying to grasp the energy systems, this can be a really complicated chapter and just complicated concepts because I'm gonna tell you guys there are semesters in college that are built into these concepts. Understanding the Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, all these things, beta oxidation. And I'm here to tell you guys, you don't need to know that level of detail. But what you do need to know is you need to have a good understanding of what bioenergetics is. And you guys can see the little image on the screen that gives you a good visual of bioenergetics. And really what it is, is it's our process of trying to take food or what we call macronutrients, carbs, proteins, and fats, and turn it into ATP, right? That's definitely a term at this stage you probably know you need to know adenosine triphosphate. This is like the energy currency inside of our cells. So as we look at the role of bioenergetics and really what we just want to understand is how do we use these three energy systems to break down the food that we take in and turn it into ATP, all right? That's as complicated as you guys need to get. But at the basis of that, and this really serves you well as you start to branch into better understanding even nutrition and understanding nutrition for training, we need to have a good concept and grasp on our three primary macronutrients. And I know you might be saying, Joe, there's four macronutrients, alcohol is one of them. And it's true, but it's not really a great energy source, so we're not even gonna cover it inside this chapter. First one, carbohydrates, what I just call CHO. What you guys need to know is the calories per gram. This means essentially the energy density, how much output, how much energy do we get from a gram of this thing? And just in case you guys don't know and you're not shouting it out already, we're gonna get four calories, right? Four kilocalories, we call of it, per gram of carbohydrate. We're gonna get nine kilocalories from fat, and we're also gonna get four from protein. Now, this is a really important concept, not just for counting calories and getting into nutrition, but especially with bioenergetics, this is energy density. This means how much energy can we get out of this thing? And right away, this is a good thing for us to note. I'm gonna give you guys a different color so we can better recognize it. Fat, unfortunately, demonized in the world of nutrition over the decades, but it's a very efficient fuel source. We get nine calories per gram, right? So that's something for us to keep in mind as we're looking at our energy systems. None of them are good or bad. All of them are important. All three of our energy systems are important and all three of these macronutrients are important. Now, as we're in this chapter specifically, and we're looking at bioenergetics, getting energy, turning things into ATP, the two that we're really gonna focus on most are gonna be carbohydrates and fats. And you might be like, well, Joe, what about protein? We can get energy from protein too. We can turn protein into fuel, right? We can use it for ATP, but it's not the primary role. And honestly, it's not really what we wanna use protein for. Our body can break down proteins and amino acids into ATP, but it's not the most efficient process. And as you look at the materials, especially if you are studying for the NASM 7th edition, inside of this bioenergetics chapter, they talk a little bit less about protein as a fuel source. And that's primarily because our body, it's much easier inside of our energy systems and it's more efficient for our body to use carbohydrates and fats as fuel. So just something that I think is important to note as we do look at these two, because even as you get into looking at energy intensity based fuel usage, like how hard am I working and what am I using for fuel, the conversation more so centers on carbs and fats, but guess what? your body's gonna get it done. So if it needs to pull from protein, it will, but not really what we want. We wanna use protein for other things, all right? So we wanna make sure you guys do have an understanding of those fuel sources. They don't talk a lot about nutrition in this chapter. That's not the point. It's more about how our body turns these things into this thing. That's really it, right? How do we turn these, and of course I can't draw a really good line here, so we'll draw it again, into adenosine triphosphate, all right? Those are those macros. And we do that through our three primary energy systems. And I think this is where a lot of people kind of get caught up and maybe get lost on these concepts. So per usual, if you guys have been following inside of our videos, I like to pride myself on trying to keep things simple because that's just the way that I think. And so I'm gonna try to simplify this for you guys.
I hope you're finding this video to be helpful and if you like the idea of being a part of a community of other people like yourself who are getting certified to become a personal trainer, I want to make sure you know that we run a free private Facebook group. So if you're interested in joining that group, make sure you check out the link below. Let's jump back in. The first one that we're going to take a look at, your first most immediate fuel source, right? Meaning that we can get fuel, we can get ATP very quickly but it's very limited, all right? We can get it fast, but it's very limited. And if you guys have been studying this stuff, you guys already know this first one we call the ATP PC or adenosine triphosphate phosphocreatine system. This one is limited. You know, for the most part, we're talking like 10 to 15 seconds of fuel. Some of this is free floating in our bloodstream. And then if you guys recognize the term phosphocreatine, it might kind of sound like a supplement, creatine monohydrate that maybe you've taken before. That's actually the purpose of this supplement is it helps to create a little bit more substrate for us to turn into ATP. And we can do it pretty quick. But like I mentioned, it gives out pretty quickly. So the question then becomes like, well, what happens next? Does our body just run out of fuel? Come on, you know this thing is way too smart for that. So a key thing inside of understanding our three energy systems is knowing that they're all three always working together. It really just has to do with percentages. Like is most of my fuel right now coming from this one, that one, or that one? But they're all three working together because we don't want just a light switch to go off and all of a sudden like we run out of fuel, right? We wanna make sure that it's a continuous process. And that's really how these three energy systems work together. ATP phosphocreatine, right? We're talking 10 second assault bike sprint. You're dying, I know and we're using that fuel up pretty quickly. But thankfully, our next energy system is already kicking in, our glycolytic. I'm always hoping I spell it right whenever I'm on camera with you guys. I'm pretty sure I'm good there, but don't call me out if I messed it up. Glycolytic, this is gonna be that next most immediate fuel source. And if you see the word glycolytic, you probably think glucose, glycogen, carbohydrates. This is where our body, especially anaerobically without oxygen, we can get fuel pretty quickly from carbohydrates, but we don't get as much as we do in this next energy system, our third oxidative. So either way, glycolytic, this is gonna fuel, let's just say, and if you look in your material, it says 30 to 60, and you're like, well, what happens between 15 to 30? They're kind of working together here a little bit. The process is a little bit longer, meaning that we get this super quickly, we have a little bit more that has to happen in here. And if we work anaerobically, we get some byproducts like lactate, hydrogen ions, lactic acid we think about. But either way, we can get fuel pretty quickly. Now, in the end though, that second energy system is still somewhat limited. First, limited goes away quick. Second is limited, but once we start to get to like two minutes and more, and as we get closer to like two minutes of continuous activity, that's really where we kick into our third, which is gonna be our oxidative. And inside of our oxidative metabolism, we can use more macronutrients, right? We can use fat, we can also use carbohydrates, all right, based upon what we're doing. And there's really, honestly, guys, very little limit to our oxidative metabolism. Most people are not gonna run out of oxidative fuel because we have, even the leanest of us, a lot of fat storage, right? So we can go for a long time without a lot of fuel. And so let's just say 60 seconds plus, and especially as we get to like two minutes or more of continuous activity, the oxidative system is gonna be that primary fuel source. So you guys might find inside of various textbooks, NASM, NSCA, all the certified personal training courses, they give you guys some examples. You might have like a 40 yard dash to 100 meter dash. That's primarily ATP phosphocreatine. Because if you've ever done an activity like that, you're not really breathing, right? Like there's no time for real breathing. You're just using the fuel you have internally. As you get longer, 30 to 60 seconds, maybe we're talking like a 200 to a 400 meter dash, right? And you're like, man, I wish I could run a 400 meter in 60 seconds. 200 to whatever, a little bit longer. That's where now we use up that ATP phosphocreatine, but we start to, boom, we're burning a lot of carbohydrates anaerobically to get that fuel. And now as I start to go like, an 800, a mile, whatever. I'm going longer, more endurance-based activity, and even much longer, then my body's gonna rely more upon that oxidative metabolism. And a lot of it has to do with the limits within each. But like I mentioned, it's not like you turn a light on or off. And I know you guys like to come 
if this isn't your first video with me. You guys like to come because of my beautiful artwork that I've been working on for you guys. And what I wanted to do, it's always helped me for, to have visuals of like how some of these systems work. Because as you guys are going through the material, you're like, I don't know, electron transport chain, Krebs cycle, there's these complicated scientific principles. Give me a simple diagram. That's what I need to know. And so that's what I've tried to do for you guys here. So what I want you to do is think about these three energy systems and the way that our body uses fuel with any activity in the sequence that it's gonna rely upon these energy systems. The first one, I don't drink much alcohol, right? But let's pretend it's our little shot glass. Little shot glass of ATP. This is the ATP phosphocreatine system. It's gonna give us some immediate fuel, right? Especially if we think of this as like a pipe, a system of pipes that are connected together. And we've got a little, I'm gonna even draw like a little faucet coming out here. Obviously I'm a gym guy, I'm not an art major guy. So let's just say, all right, we got ATP phosphocreatine coming out, but we can tell it's gonna run out really quick. Thankfully though, these systems are working together to catch up. It's not a perfect example, so don't call me out. I know it's not perfectly scientifically sound, but it's a great visual and idea. Thankfully though, as this is going away, my glycolytic is already working, right? It's not like I have to turn on and off a light switch to make those come in. My glycolytic system's already kicking in. Those processes are happening to help make sure that I don't run out of fuel. And you can see this next energy system, our glycolytic, it's got a much bigger capacity, but there still might be a limit to it. We might run out of glycogen stores. If any of you guys have ever done any endurance activities, especially like half marathons, marathons, people talk about hitting the wall. And that usually is an indication somewhere in this like 17 to 20 miles in, where if they're not fueling appropriately, they might actually run out of glycogen in the body, carbohydrate storage, and bam, it's like they can't go any further or their performance drastically drops that would be depleting that. For most of us, it's not the scenario we're dealing with. But again, 10 to 15 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds, two minutes and greater. You can see now the oxidative system, it's like we found a, you know, a, a water tower, if those still exist, where you are, right? We got a water tower, endless supply of ATP, phosphocreatine, but it takes a little longer to get there. And that's really the simplest way of looking at it. We can create a, a great amount of fuel here it's very efficient, but because of things like beta oxidation, the Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain, those things that are mentioned, especially inside of this chapter in the NASM material, they're processes that take more time. Now, I do wanna tell you guys, you do not need to memorize those processes. You just need to know that they're a part of what it takes to get some things down to ATP, especially with the oxidative system. So all these three systems are constantly working together. And what I like for you guys is to give you guys some good study tools. If you are inside the NASM materials, you guys can actually refer to figure 8-11, which gives you another visual with different types of activity of what percentage, right? How much of that's from ATP, how much of that's from glycolytic, and how much of that is from oxidative. Because you'll see whether it's a short duration sprint or a long, long duration activity, they're all three still working together to give us the fuel that we need. And on top of that, another great one for you guys to take a look at is actually table 8-1. If I just had to tell you guys one chart that it might be helpful to look at to know the variables on, this is gonna be the one really cuts through the noise and simplifies for you guys, hey, just understand these three systems. They are really how we break down fuel into that ATP, the energy currency of the body, because without ATP, we don't have muscle contraction. And so it makes sense that these three systems are gonna to continue to work together to fuel what we need. Outside of that, guys, don't get caught up in a lot of the other scientific concepts that are in this chapter. The other probably good takeaway for you guys is things that are mentioned in there. They mention things like VT1, ventilatory threshold one, VT2, ventilatory threshold two. What they're talking about in there is that there is an intensity dependent relationship between the fuel that we use. As we're working at lower intensities right now, right? Even though you're like high intensity learning, you're low intensity activity. You're not doing a lot. You're hanging out watching a video what do you think your body is gonna use more for fuel? Fat or carbohydrates? It's gonna be more on the fat side, right? Because again, think our body is all about survival and doing what's easiest. And we've got time right now while you're at a lower intensity. Fat's a very efficient fuel source. Now, as I move into higher intensities of activity, I shift more and more towards carbohydrate metabolism. And that's what they talk about when they're talking about energy intensity based you know, fuel usage. That with those lower intensity activities, 
I'm gonna be using more fat for fuel, higher intensity activities, I'm gonna be using more carbohydrates. And this brings up one final concept that I want you guys to also remember, and that is EPOC excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. And you've given some different charts inside the material, but I think actually maybe, again, a helpful visual for you guys is to know, EPOC refers to this concept of like, hey, there's this afterburn when I do activity, especially if I'm doing intervals, sprints, or even with resistance training, that this idea that when I'm done, I'm burning more calories. And it's true, it might not be as great as some places make it out to be, but it's because, and this again is why I think this visual is great. It's because this continues to get depleted. And you can think about it as like every time this continues to get depleted, you're racking up debt. That has to be repaid at some point in time. Epoch talks about it as this oxygen deficit. You continue to rack up a debt that has to be repaid. And what happens is when you're done doing what you're doing or during your rest intervals in between activity, the oxidative system is working to replenish your ATP phosphocreatine. So I love this because it really just shows this interdependent nature of our energy systems and the fact that we really need and rely upon all three of these. Hopefully this video helped you guys cut through some of the noise and simplify your approach towards mastering bioenergetics and just understanding energy systems. And if you wanna better understand how to practically apply this information, especially when it comes to cardiovascular training, make sure you guys check out the next video on the screen where we break down exactly what to do to progress your cardiovascular.